of L-O-V-E. We've all, we've all played, well, most of us have played Scrabble. And you can spell that word in many different ways. Because love is, is a part of everything that's good. I mean, you, you can spell kindness. You've got to have love. <laughs> There's no kindness. You can spell faithfulness. True faithful, faithfulness of God. You got to have love, or it's just a clinging symbol or a tinkling brass, like, like Susan quoted a while ago. This is the biggest love letter ever written. The writer spans 1,600 years, three continents, over 40 authors, bits and pieces. Even King Lemuel had some things in here. Even, even Nebuchadnezzar wrote some things in the Bible. and He's about as, as uh, disgusting of a sinner that ever lived. Nebuchadnezzar, and God allowed him to write his testimony of how God rescued his soul. All these different people from all these different places writing the same message, the same love letter from Jesus. Three different languages in the ancient texts. One primary theme the glory of God and salvation to everyone believing in Jesus Christ. There's some really more popular verses in the Bible about love. This is one of them. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and doeth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. So, beloved, let us love one another, First John 4, 7 and 8. How many of you have never sung that song? You've never heard it or sung it? Wow. We need to get you a one-way ticket to Pine Springs Ranch for the summer. <laughs> They'll sing it up there. Or actually, it would, it would save the church a little money. We'll just send you over to La Sierra Academy for one of their worship services and tell them to be sure and sing that. Because when kids sing it and, and, and the excitement and energy at a summer camp around a campfire, it's just beautiful. But it's beautiful whenever we read it. And we're all alone, just with us in our Bible, all alone somewhere in our house or somewhere out in the, on a walk or something. We open our Bible, we read these kind of things. It just floods our soul with his glory because his glory is love. Because God is love. It's right there. God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten and his uniquely begotten son into the world that we might live through Jesus, through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the payment, the sacrifice, the justifier, the equalizer, the stabilizer, the healer, the cleanser, the, the transformer. Jesus is all that and much, much more. Beloved, if God had so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Wow. And it's the same word, agape. That's how we're called. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate the most vile, rebellious sinner from the love of God. God will love forever. Amen. He will never stop loving those who have hated him and rejected him and despised him and defied him. He, he loves and his love is always present because he is always present. And it's always love when God does something. It's always love. Deep, deep, deep love sometimes. More deep than our minds can dive and discover. But he always moves out of love because he is love. And this is what Jesus was saying. 
This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. It doesn't get any higher than that. It doesn't get any more impossible for humans than that. To love each other the way Jesus loves us is impossible in our own strength, in our own human abilities. But all things are possible to them who, we don't know that verse, believe. I can do all things through love, which is the same as Christ, who strengtheneth me. And I say strengtheneth because I'm from Oklahoma. Californians say strengtheneth, strengtheneth. I can't even say it. I say string, like strength, strength. And I hope you don't stumble on that. <laughs> but it's amazing how people could get caught up in criticizing how you pronounce words and miss the gospel. It just defies my imagination, but it does happen. Loving one another as Jesus loved us? Wow. That's got to be a faith thing, you know. That's got to be a, I believe Jesus can pull this off in me. I believe he can do it in me because he did it in Peter. He did it in, in Elijah. He did it in who? He did it in Moses. You know, Moses didn't like that Egyptian that he killed. He didn't like him. I don't think he loved him either. I don't think Moses knew what love was. All he knew is that God had spared him and he was somebody special and he had to go do something to deliver the slaves and he messed it all up because he didn't have that beautiful pure love leading his path but 40 years later he was ready to roll in Jesus and he came loving there's no doubt in my mind or God would not have backed him up the way he did. Amen. He came loving. I believe when that last plague fell and the firstborn of Pharaoh was slain by the death angel that night, I believe Moses was weeping Amen. somewhere alone. Heartbroken that Pharaoh had rejected the call of the gospel. And I believe that's how we need to weep when people reject the gospel. And we need to do that. We need to experience that kind of love. We need the love of Jesus. When people despise us, when people persecute us and say all manner of evil about us and against us, we need to learn how to weep for them and for ourselves. Because that's what love does. Jeremiah lived in one of the most fiercest, desperate, harshest times in Israel's history. They were kidnapping their their finest children, young people, women and men and women. They were, they were unicizing the men and they were prostituting their most beautiful women in Babylon. It was a terrible time. It was a terrible time. Daniel was there with Jeremiah. God would not have honored and backed up Daniel the way he did if he had not had the love of Jesus flooding his soul for the ones who eunuchized him. And if you don't know what eunuchized is, you check with me afterwards. There's a harsher term that we use on the farm. I'm not going to use it here today. It takes a lot of love to love the people that do that kind of stuff to you. But we're headed straight for that experience, folks. We're moving that direction. I don't know if I'll be alive when the time of trouble gets here, but I hope I am. Amen. I hope God spares me so he can use me 
to love the people who hate me and persecute me. I hope, I hope he can use me the way he used Stephen that day. How about you? Do, you? do you really want God to become that mighty in you? Amen. Amen. Because the people around us who love us and who hate us, they need to see Jesus in us. The same way we need to see Jesus in others. And they need to hear him talking through us. Well, they're not going to hear him. It's a serious thing, and it's, it's our calling. It's our time. And he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now, this sounds like a con contradiction because Jesus laid down his life for his enemies. Right? And so did Stephen. And so did Paul, the guy who helped kill Stephen. When they, when they executed him, when they decapitated him, I am thoroughly convinced he was asking God to have mercy on the ones who were executing him. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. He probably was praying the very same prayer that he heard Stephen praying when he helped kill Stephen because the love of God had invaded his soul and he was excited about it and he didn't hide it. He didn't hide it from me. He wanted to make sure everybody knew that Jesus was real. And you know, you know he was witnessing and praying and preaching and maybe even singing for those last few seconds of his existence on earth as a human being. Wow. Wait till we get to see the replay of that during that thousand years. It's going to be amazing. I don't know if God's going to show Stephen that one first or I don't know. Maybe when Stephen has his personal one-on-one -on -one with Jesus before any of the rest of us get to see it, maybe he's going to show Stephen what, how Paul died. The one who helped kill him. It wouldn't, that would, God's going to outdo me, I know. He, he's, he outdoes all of us. He, he's beyond anything we can imagine. But I can imagine those kind of things happening when we get there. God is so creative. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. That sounds a little bit like a narcissist. If you do what I tell you, then I'll like you. No, 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 no. But I, I know the enemy can twist it and make it sound like that. An atheist, they do that to the Bible. They twist all kinds of things. What he's saying is, you're my helpers. You're my comforters. You're the ones I, I, I surround myself with. Because you only do what love does. Because you're a doer of love. And I want to be, and, and I, know, I hear Jesus saying, I want to be surrounded by people who are doers of love. Amen. That's what a real friend is. Someone who loves you enough to, to weep with you and also to rejoice with you. But someone who loves you enough to tell you how they really feel. Or how they think things are going. That it's great to be surrounded by people when they tell you something about yourself. You, when, when someone tells me stuff and the Holy Spirit says, yeah, that's what I've been telling you. Now I've now, now I got to use this guy to tell you. You know, you take that into your heart and you say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I call, have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. Now you need to understand that that's what Jesus said right there, but 60 years later, he comes and talks to John the Revelator, and he calls them servants. So in the context of the Bible, what I hear Jesus saying here is, I no longer only call you servants. You're not only my servants. You're my friends too.
You're my brothers and my sisters. Because that's the only way that the book of Revelation can be in harmony, the harmony of love, the only way that Revelation, and John wrote chapter 15 of John, he wrote Revelation as well. And John knew what he was writing. So don't go and tell people we're no longer servants. That's not what Jesus is saying. What he's saying in the context of the whole Bible, I don't only, you're not just my servants, you're also my friends. Or else you're going to miss a lot of excitement serving Jesus before and during and after the great time of trouble that is coming. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. This fruit is Galatians 5, 22 and following, the fruit of the Spirit. Love produces all those things. And that's what God has ordained. In fact, he has predestined that every human being live like this. God has predestined that every human being should live the fruit of the Spirit. Now, we know that's not going to happen. Because Jesus said, many are upon the path, and wide is the path to destruction that goes, and few who go into the narrow path. So we know that's not going to happen, but it doesn't mean he doesn't want it that way. He predestined. Paul uses the word predestined. And we're going to get to that soon in the book of Romans. But it doesn't mean he forces you to be good against your will. God will not do that. He won't do that. Which tells me that when Balaam was going to try to curse Israel and instead he blessed them, that means his heart was divided. He was maybe, he was maybe 49% for, for greed and, and, and selfish gain and maybe 51 or maybe 50.00000001 percent for I better do what God says because God does not overrule our will maybe he was 49.9999999 against Israel against God I don't know but I trust my God he will never force me to love him he will never force me to love you he will never force me to love Moses or Joshua and the children of Israel and Moses as they passed by. He did not force Balaam to love them. There was something in Balaam's heart that God was able to click on and work through. And I tell you what, it's, it's the size of a mustard seed difference. It's all it takes. So don't count yourself out. Don't count your loved ones out. Even if they never come to church, don't count them out. They may be having church every day just alone with Jesus. Maybe they've been hurt so bad they can't come to church. Maybe someone at the church has violated them so terrible they can no longer come to church. I don't know. There's going to be people in heaven who, who you never saw in church. But I also know that coming to church should cause you and me to help others get on the road to heaven. It's a lot easier when I got a bunch of people helping me figuring out how to get people to heaven. It's a much more productive situation. And that's why God created the church. And that, that's why he said when you come together, provoke one another in love and good works. In Hebrews 10. It all connects with love. It all connects together. You did not choose me, he said. I chose you. Jesus chose every human being to be with him in heaven. He's not going to get his way, and I don't like that, because he deserves to have every human being in his family in heaven. Jesus deserves that. That tells me this is a serious battle going on down here when God himself doesn't get everything he wants. So when people say, why didn't God answer my prayers? I don't know, why didn't he answer his own prayers? You go to the cross to find that. He did not answer the prayers of Jesus, of, of, of his son. At least not in the infirmity. He didn't remove the cup from Jesus. And sometimes we have to drink that cup. 
And we need to say, I don't care. I don't care if God never answers any of my prayers. I know he still loves me. I know he still wants me. And I know someday I'll be with him in heaven and I'll see him with my own eyes standing on this earth in the last day. Even if worms destroy my flesh, I will see him with my own eyes. We need to be able to say that. Just like Job. Just like Job. These things I command you that you love, you agape one another. We're going to sing this song. As we close. And then afterwards, those that are able to have some prayer time with each other, maybe by yourself. Greater love has no man than he lay down his life for his friends. You know what that tells me? Jesus considers his enemies his friends. That's, it has to be. Because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and Jesus died for sinners. It even says in Romans 5, he died for the enemies of the cross. He died for his enemies. And he considers them his friends. Before we even care about him, he classifies you and me as his best friends. Man, that's, that's what a Savior. So I'm going to ask uh, Charlie and Esper to come up here too. We're going to sing this together. And if you sense that the Lord is calling you just to come up front, just to, just to have a special time with him, then please feel free to come. And if you just want to come up here and pray by yourself, that's fine. We're not going to bother you unless you ask us to bother you, unless you ask us to pray with you. I know Cheryl's here. She'll pray with anybody. Alex and Angelica. I know Jill. Man, we had an incredible prayer vigil two weeks ago. It was an overflowing experience. I know some couldn't be here, and we understand that. Man, it was huge. And we had miracles at Oshkosh. Serious, bona fide, documentable, big-time miracles at Oshkosh. Just uncanny what God did there. And, and you know, you don't have to come up front to get those kind of miracles. But I have a sneaking suspicion that when we humble ourselves a little bit in front of our friends and in front of other people, it kind of skids the, it kind of greases the skids a little bit. Because we receive more when we go low at the feet of Jesus. So let's sing this and let the Spirit lead us. If you want to come, please come. We'll pray. And, and we'll just have a wonderful refreshing here this afternoon before we go home. Think about His love. Think about his love, think about his goodness, think about his grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. of our Father's love. Now before we dismiss, you may be here today and, and, and maybe you're saying, I can't trust those people. They've hurt me so many times. You know, we're not asking you to trust us. We're asking you to forgive us. And we're asking you to give Jesus another try, another shot to do something more incredible and wonderful and beautiful than any of us can ever imagine. We're asking, we're asking each other, let's just give Jesus a little micrometer, a little millimeter, and see if he might fill us with his love so that the next time, the next time, his pure love will flow out of our mouths and out of our hearts the next time we get in a sticky situation with somebody something weird goes crazy you know just maybe maybe you've never really ever really let Jesus do what he does right now is an opportunity to do it. it's a lot easier to do it here than it is out there the enemy's got a million distractions out there just waiting to bombard you, bombard you with. 
And before you know it, two, three, six months, 10 years will fly by and you haven't given your life to Jesus. I urge you to consider it and do it today before you leave here. And let somebody know about it. Tell, call your grandma. Call your children. Call somebody. If you're just giving your life to Jesus for the first time, tell somebody. Tell an old drinking buddy or an old partying friend, girl or somebody used to party. Just tell somebody, hey, I just did something and I hope you do it too. I, ho I hope somebody does that today and see what God might do. Let, let's stand together and sing this one more time. And of course, you're welcome to come forward as the Spirit draws. Think about His love. Think about His goodness. Think about His grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love.